Good morning and welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of March 24th, 2022, per Executive Order N-08-21, which suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act. This meeting will be conducted entirely by teleconferencing. Per the Brown Act, we have posted a notice of the meeting agenda 72 hours in advance. This meeting is being conducted on a Zoom webinar platform. Members of the public may participate and provide comments by accessing the meeting online or by calling into the meeting. Instructions are included on the city's website and on today's agenda. I would now like to take a roll call. As I call your name, please indicate if you are present. Commissioner Boomhauer? Present. Commissioner Malbro? Present. Commissioner Miyahara? Present. Commissioner Modane? Present. Commissioner Otsuji? Present. Commissioner Van? Present. And Chairman Hoffman is present. The staff members online with us today are Renee Mezzo from Development Services, Kelly Stanko from Planning Department, Corinne Newford, Deputy City Attorney, and Tony Khalil, Deputy City Engineer. And before we begin our agenda, I would like to introduce our two newly appointed planning commissioners, uh, Ted Miyahara and Carmen Van. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind, um, starting with you, Carmen, if you would like to say a few words about yourself, your background. Uh, thank you, Chair Hoffman. Uh, good morning. My name is Carmen Van. I am a construction executive and have been building in uh, San Diego since oh, 2003. Um, I'm excited to be on board and to serve the community in this community. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, and Commissioner Miyahara. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me start by saying that I consider it a real privilege to serve the city of San Diego as a planning commissioner. Uh, I have some big shoes to fill with uh, former Commissioner Wayland in Austin terming out. Uh, my personal background is in development and housing finance. I uh, currently serve as the president of San Diego Community Housing Corporation, which is a local nonprofit. Um, I also spent about six years working for the San Diego Housing Commission, which is essentially the city's uh, housing department um, and uh, issues bonds uh, and housing authority um, responsible for lending uh, and investing. Excited to be a commissioner. Uh, I'm a houser at heart, um, which means I've learned to love uh, policy and, and can see the benefits of economic development and everything that stems from that. Thank you. All right, welcome both of you. Very happy you're aboard with us. And so with that, we'll now start our agenda and we'll start with public comment for non-agenda items. Uh, this portion of the agenda is an opportunity for the public to make comments on planning related items that are not on today's agenda. Any person wishing to speak will have three minutes maximum to provide testimony. And if you'd like to speak, please at this time, click on the raised hand icon on your screen. Okay, well, uh, we have one speaker, uh, Sally Small. Sally, you'll have three minutes. Good morning. I'm with the Choice Valley Community Planning Group uh, recently moved to being a secretary and I do our social media and I'm asking that uh, in the future as you make the changes to community planning groups that you include information for uh, having a website that can be usable by the public so that we can be transparent and continue to do our work and I thank you for that. And uh, as CPG uh, reforms are being pushed through, I'd hope that you would uh, consider those of us that are in lower income areas, uh, that it's hard for us to get people to uh, join us. Uh, my particular group is nice and, and diverse, but not all of us can uh, make it to the meetings on a consistent basis. And we don't know how to do publicity. So we need help from the planning uh, department and uh, whoever else that can help us with uh, media sources so that we can get the word out better uh, because we're not trained in that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peggy Walker. 
Yes, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm an environment advocate and understanding this commission's concern and respect for the environment. I wanted to call your attention to and ask your support for California Assembly Bill 1690. This bill, especially important to our coastal communities, prohibits the sale of four non-biodegradable plastic smoke products that are damaging the ocean and fragile ecosystems. It bans single-use cigarette filters or butts, which are made of cellulose acetate, a non-biodegradable plastic. They are the most litter product in the world, representing 34% of collected trash, far more than plastic food or beverage wrappers. Also plastic cigar filters, single use electronic cigarettes with non-rechargeable batteries and single use integrated cannabis vaporizers that are non-refillable or rechargeable. Rechargeable products are not included. These non-essential, non-biodegradable products are destroying our environment, our land and our water and endangering wildlife. Our planet is at a critical tipping point. Cigarette filters destroy the environment unlike any other discarded waste and the toxic chemicals seeps into fragile ecosystems according to the bill's author, Luce Rivas. Our communities locally grapple with the burden of disposing non-disposable e-cig and vape product hazardous waste. This is especially true on school grounds because of storing student use and resulting waste. So I would ask you, please consider writing California state legislators to ask them to pass AB 1690. A letter from you as commissioners or from this board would carry very much weight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one caller um, ending in 5559. If you can go ahead and state your full name, please. Yes, um, my name is Matt Wallstrom and I live in Hillcrest. Um, I submitted written public comment regarding the uh, noticing the or the agendas noticing means of participating to the public and I really would like an answer on that. Um, after, uh, you know, uh, February the 3rd, there were changes to the agenda where it was no longer uh, the, the language was struck that you could submit uh, public comment by directly by email um, and uh, every agenda including the one for today going forward has had that language stricken um, and I would like I it, it, I would request that it be restored so that it, this uh, commission is uh, in a is in accord in you know complying with the uh, same requirements and the same means of allowing public access uh, as uh, Every, every other part of the city government. Uh, and um, I would like to know why that language was stricken from the agendas um, in the first place. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that, there are no other speakers to speak on non-agenda items. So we'll go on. Uh, there are no items to, requested to be continued or withdrawn. Um, and there are no items to be placed on the consent agenda. So with that, we will approve the agenda as is. And are there any director's reports? Hi, Chair Hoffman, Renee Mezzo with Development Services. I just, on behalf of Development Services, I wanted to welcome Commissioner Vaughn and Commissioner Miyahara to this board. Um, we look forward to working with you and are here to provide any support that you may need. Um, so that's all I had today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Good morning, um, Chair Hoffman and members of the commission um, and welcome to Commissioners Miyahara and Van. I'm Kelly Stonko, Acting Deputy Director in the Planning Department. The planning department is continuing to work on the Hillcrest focus plan amendment to the Uptown Community Plan. And we are currently seeking feedback with the Choose Your Future Hillcrest interactive online engagement tool. This will support the department's efforts to identify opportunities for new housing, public spaces and transportation infrastructure within Hillcrest, present potential options where new housing, public spaces and infrastructure could be located, 
determine community supported solutions to local challenges and collect feedback to be incorporated into the Uptown Community Plan. Members of the public can visit planhillcrest.org to participate in the Choose Your Future Hillcrest now through April 11th, and we encourage everyone to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go to, on to commission comments. Uh, are there any commission comments? Just raise your hand if you'd like to say anything. Seeing as none we will start our agenda. Uh, the first item is T-Mobile 40th Street. Uh, staff, if you'd like to go ahead and make a presentation. Thank you. Before I get started, I'll leave this card up for anyone wishing to call in. Good morning, Chairman Hoffman and esteemed commissioners. This is Ian Hecox with Development Services Department presenting the T-Mobile 40th Street Wireless Communication Facility Project. The project is located at 3073 40th Street in the RS1-7 zone within the Mid-City City Heights Community Plan area. The project hey, requires- Through the chair, Mr. Haycock, I cannot hear you hardly at all. Hmm. Is that just me? It is just a little bit hard to hear. Hmm. I don't know where your microphone is. I don't know if you can get Take my microphone off. That's better, go. Ian. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so uh, the project requires a conditional use permit, plan development permit, and a neighborhood use, or sorry, neighborhood development permit. The project was determined to be categorically exempt from CEQA pursuant to section 15303, new construction of the state CEQA guidelines. The project proposes a new 70 foot faux eucalyptus tree and associated equipment enclosure on a vacant residential lot. The tree will consist of nine panel antennas and nine remote radio heads. The eight foot tall enclosure will be 768 square feet where the mono tree T-Mobile equipment and available area for another future carrier's equipment will be included. Land uses surrounding the site include Manzanita Canyon to the south and residential developments to the north, east, south, and west. Photo survey shows views looking south towards Manzanita Canyon with mature trees surrounding the site on a vacant lot. The photo sim shows the proposed facility. The applicant is required to use all reasonable means to conceal or minimize the visual impact of the WCF through integration utilizing architecture, landscaping, and siding. As designed, the WCF is integrated within the property due to siding, coloring, and location surrounding, surrounded by mature trees. Conditional use permit is required as the project is located in a residential zone without residential development. Uh, the planned development permit is required when a project deviates from applicable zoning regulations. And the neighborhood development permit is required when the equipment enclosure exceeds 250 square feet at, as the project proposes 768 square feet. And the, the enclosure wall is greater than six feet in height near the property line, and it's proposed as an eight foot wall. A VDP is required um, because the project requ requests a deviation from the residential zone requirements. The residential zone permits a maximum height of 30 feet, and the mono tree will be 68, 65 feet with a five foot crown to resemble a live tree. The Mid-City City Heights Community Planning Group approved the project on October 5th, 2021 with a vote of 16 approved, one declined and one abstained. Staff has determined that the facility is consistent with the general plan, the Mid-City City Heights Community Plan and the purpose and intent of the wireless communication ordinance. To conclude, staff has reviewed the proposed project and all issues identified through the review process have been resolved. Therefore, staff recommends approval for the conditional use permit 
uh, neighborhood use permit or development permit and plan development permit. This concludes staff's report for the T-Mobile 4D Street project. Staff is available for any questions. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go into clarification questions and uh, I, I'd like to start um, just for clarity and I think all the commission understands it, but I, I wanna make sure the public does as well. Could, could you explain um, what uh, abilities we have as a commission to uh, discuss electromagnetic radiation and the health effects of that? Sure, um, the telecommunication Telecommunication Act of 1996 preempts local governments from regulating the placement, construction, and modification of wireless communication facilities on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the Federal Communication Commission standards for such emissions. Staff has received a radio frequency report from EBI Consulting indicating that the RF emissions for the project is below the FCC allowance. And I can also make the RF report uh, available to the public as well. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other clarification questions from any of the commission? Yeah, yes, Commissioner Malbro. Yeah, thank you. I just have one. Uh, in your SIM photo, it kind of showed that the, um, the facility was very close to some overhead wiring. And I'm just curious, uh, public wiring, is is there a setback requirement for that? Uh, there is not a setback requirement for uh, overhead uh, wires. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other clarification questions? If not, with that, we will go into... Here. Oh, I'm sorry? Here. Yes. I, have a, oh, I have a quick question. Oh, dang, sorry, didn't see your um, uh, Mr. Hecox, can you tell us why it needs to be 75 feet and not the standard lower height for that area? Was there a reason? Um, I would like to refer to the applicant who is on the call. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Gary Castle, the applicant uh, of Vertical Bridge is the company that's building the site for T-Mobile. Uh, the answer to your question is it's a 70 foot uh, tall tower instead of, or excuse me, a tree uh, and 65 feet is the actual pole height. Uh, so it's a little less than what we had, what you had mentioned at 75. Um, the actual reason is, is because there's other, we're trying to set up the uh, 5G network. And part of the 5G network is, is that we have to be at a certain height to be able to, to service the other uh, sites or the actual existing sites that are in the area. So T-Mobile has requested, uh, and actually they need and or would like to require uh, that type of footage in order to get uh, the antennas to the height that can service uh, the area, if that makes sense. We've got some really poor coverage in that area. Is that, Got it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. All right, uh, not seeing any other hands and we will now go into the public testimony. We'll open public testimony for this item. Uh, and does the applicant, uh, Mr. Cassell, do you have a presentation at all to make? No, sir, I'm uh, here for your questions of any kind. All right, thank you. Uh, if there's anyone who does wish to speak on this item, please click on the raised hand icon on your screen and give you just a couple, few seconds here. Looks like there are no uh, people wishing to speak. But just uh, wanna make sure, anyone who does wish to speak, click on the raised hand icon. All right, uh, there, seeing as there is nobody, we will now close the public testimony portion and let's go right to planning commission discussion. Um, let's start with uh, Commissioner Boomhauer. Thank you, Chair Hoffman. Um, I, staff did a great presentation on this. I think it, my questions have been answered. So, you know, shout out to my friend, uh, former Vice Chair Hoffman, to get the ball rolling. 
Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and make a uh, motion to support staff recommendation. Thank you're you. You're talking about former Vice Chair Whalen. Or I'm sorry, former Vice Chair Whalen. <laughs> sorry. I'm glad I'm still on. I was looking at you and looking at him. Sorry. I'll second. I have no further comments, Chair. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, so we have a motion on the floor from Commissioner Boomhauer and a second uh, by Commissioner Malbro for supporting the staff recommendation for this item. Uh, let's go on to Commissioner Malbro. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm in support of the, pro, of the project itself and uh, ready to move forward. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miyahara. No questions or comments. I'm in support of the item. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mode. I have nothing, nothing further to add. I'm in support. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Otsuji. Yes, a couple of questions uh, to the staff and also to the applicant. Uh, first uh, question um, in regards to uh, where the facility is located. There is a six foot chain link fence and a proposed six foot chain link fence and a proposed eight foot wall. And it looks like the area is undeveloped. So the question to the staff is, what is required uh, for any improvements there besides the fixed elements that are proposed? Because it looks like it's undeveloped. And most of the time when we see something like this, uh, we require some type of uh, 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 improvements uh, around uh, what is being added to that area. The question staff. Um, I'm gonna refer this to my supervisor, um, uh, Mr. Simon Fee. Commissioner Osushi, nice to talk to you again. I see you. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> as it relates to this particular project, um, we relied on existing elements in the area to support the tree. And you're absolutely correct. If there, were, if there weren't any landscaping and, and, and needed some additional landscaping, our landscape staff would have conditioned the project to include such elements. However, uh, upon reviewing the site, we were able to determine that the existing landscaping in the area was acceptable. Uh, and keep in mind, Commissioner Suji, this project has a 10 year expiration date. So if there are future development that takes place here, um, it's something that we will revisit 10 years from now. Yeah. Um, just like any other wireless communication facility that involves a faux tree. Thank you. Uh, I thought that was the answer that I was gonna get. Uh, uh, and I understand that. And my understanding is that the uh, applicant owns all the lots within that area. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I know it's not a requirement. So I'm to the applicant, I'm, I'm asking if there is, uh, would you, would you be willing to add some, um, additional landscape around the perimeter of what you're adding uh, on the wall and the chain link to kind of soften it. I know it's not uh, developed and I understand that, but I'm sure you'd like to see maybe some nicer things there and, you know, give you a head start in any improvements uh, uh, that you would be doing in that area. Because looking around in the area, it looks like a very nice neighborhood. This area is undeveloped. Yeah. And you're putting uh, this uh, uh, equipment there uh, for the use of the entire area. Right. So would you be willing to do that? Well, the only challenge we did go through, we've been doing this for about two years now. Uh, we did actually, meaning going through the process on the zoning side, uh, we had a lengthy conversation and many emails back and forth between the officials of the landscaping department or the landscaping part of the, the zoning department. And we came to the conclusion that, and we thought about it and actually advocated the idea of doing something except the lot itself is just as wide as we are going there, if that makes sense to you. Our lease space area and the lot itself didn't give us the opportunity because the moment we go to do any kind of landscaping, we're gonna be in the 
uh, we're going to be past the parcel line. So uh, that was one of the things that came up that was kind of a, a challenge for us because we didn't really have a way to be able to do it. And then on the other hand, because of the other foliage that's already there, there's actually a wash as you go down, uh, you, if you can see, uh, where there's all kinds of large trees and so forth that, that it gave us the opportunity to have some of the existing landscaping that the officials from the zoning department just talked about. Uh, and that's why we went there is because we could see that, uh, you know, our tree would kind of blend in with some of the other trees that were there. Um, we ran into a little bit of a challenge with uh, the landscaping department actually was okay with the, what we already had there, meaning existing outside of our lease space area and the site itself. So we went forward with this, believe me, we spent months going through the process with the landscaping department to try to figure out if we could do something, if there was a need to do something. And after them looking at a lot of pictures and things that you don't see on your, on your report, that you know that allowed us to be able to go forward the way it is. I, sorry, I, if I had a way, I'd be doing it. But the truth is, we don't have any space. Okay, and I appreciate the comments and understand the situation, and also appreciate um, the finishes that you have on there. You did address it in regards to the yes, color and the finish, especially on the chain link fence. It's not yes, just sir. the chain link fence. You were able to soften the effect of that. So, you know. I'll be supporting the motion and uh, hopefully in the future when there's improvements there that we would be able to address this issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Van. Uh, no comment, I support. All right, thank you. Um, I just, uh, for me, a follow-up question to Commissioner Otsuji. Um, you know, a stark eight foot wall, obviously no one really wants to have that if we could avoid it. But can you explain, Mr. Kessel, um, why the need for the eight foot versus say a six foot wall? You know, that's a standard in the industry for all of the carriers. They come in with a larger or a taller wall. Um, the equipment itself is at six feet and it sits on a platform, well, a platform, a, a cement, uh, you know, structure base, not even a structure, it's cement ground. Uh, and that causes us to, we don't want anything to be seen in any way. So the thought process is, is that because we have the equipment, the size or the height that it is, it's so important to not have that be featured, even from people that can see above, if that makes sense to the houses that are maybe up on the hill, that kind of thing. So uh, eight feet is what we thought was, uh, would be the standard. It is the standard in the industry and we wanted to make sure that the equipment would not be seen or you know, that it would be hard to see, let's say. So eight feet is what we picked. Okay, so, but six feet equipment, it would be screened at least horizontally, correct, from any view? Oh, your... no question, no question, sir. That's exactly what we're trying to solve. Yes, sir. So you'd be, um, you're, you're concerned, the eight feet is for people that are overseeing. Is that That's right? Hey, yes, sir. Well, it's more than that, but yes, sir, you're, you're right. We, we're doing everything we can to make sure the equipment doesn't get seen. Okay. All right. I, I, I say something. <laughs> this is Steve Young. I'm the architect. Yes. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, Gary's correct. Basically, the eight foot is, is for screening, but the other op is for security. It's a lot harder to climb an eight foot wall than it is a six foot wall. So there, there's, there's multi-purposes for that, you know, versus putting a chain link with Bob wire and stuff. We, we, we agree that the look of a stucco CMU wall that, you know, the eight foot height fully screens the equipment and also again, helps prevent vandalism. Okay. Um, I don't know if I agree completely with that, but I, I'm not going to push the issue. Um, I just think something smaller to Commissioner Otsuchi's point would be a little less of a visual impact since we can't landscape, we're right at the yeah, edge. True, and, and, and like Gary said, we-, we that, That's okay. We definitely uh, like to landscape it our, ourselves. You know, we do agree with the landscaping concept and hopefully in future development of the parcels next to it, because again, we are restricted with our lot, our lease area there, that again, possibly some landscape could be added in the future. And I think that's a really good idea. All right. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I, like I said, I'm not going to push that issue. Um, I, I'm okay with this. Um, Thank you, sir. So we will go ahead with that. Uh, if there's no other commission comments, we will go ahead and take a vote. And again, let me uh, rephrase that. Or uh, This is a motion by Commissioner Boomhauer, a second by Commissioner Malbro for supporting the staff recommendation. Uh, Commissioner Boomhauer. Aye. Commissioner Malbro. Aye. Commissioner Miyahara. Aye. Commissioner Modane. Aye. Commissioner Otsuji. Aye. Commissioner Van. Aye. And Commissioner uh, Chair Hoffman is an aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you so much, folks. Okay, Ooh. thank you. Thank you. All right, we will move on to our second item. This is Build Better uh, San Diego. Staff, if you'd like to go ahead and make a presentation. Good morning, everyone. Sharing my screen. I will leave this on for a minute. All right, we'll get started. And before I start with the presentation, we would like to share a video that we were able to um, create with the help of our engagement partner. My city. My city. I love San Diego. I love San Diego. I love San Diego. My city. Love, love, love San Diego. You know, I've watched this place grow for the last 20 something years. This neighborhood? Everything, you know. I grew up here. It's all I've ever known. It's beautiful. The beaches. It's wonderful. There's a lot of pride here. We are able to share our traditions. The diversity. Culture. The food. Food trucks. Taco shops. Boba. Farmers markets on Saturdays. I appreciate people and, you know, diversity. Many languages that are shared here and cultures and beliefs. A hardworking community with a lot of different cultures around it. If you're new here, I'd say try out the food, but to also like not judge because it might look a little like poor and that stuff, but I'm still like very unique in its own way. I have a feeling that because many homes here are pretty small and beat up. Not a lot of street lights. Homelessness. A lot of trash. Potholes. It scares outsiders into they don't visit our neighborhood. Yeah, I, I think the build better policy, I, I believe it's a good idea and I I'm hopeful that the city council will pass it. It sounds great. Um, having one pool of money to, and giving it to the communities that most need it. I don't think that's a secret which communities need it because they're the ones that have been needing it for decades. It, I think it's a step that they're taking to acknowledge us as residents and people who live here. Um, and I think it's going to be a really, really great change for, for the residents here to see something positive in their neighborhood. They came to our school. At the local library here. To our community. They had us doing all these things. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It was a little awkward. But fun. Laughter is a good thing. I think just reminding people that we are part of something bigger. We're part of something bigger, you know? We can be united. They said maybe some things will change for our neighborhood. Things could get better. They were listening to us. They were listening to us. That my voice matters. Cleaner parks. Equity. More light. More trees. Buses. We want the chance. I think that the Build Better policy should pass because it will finally highlight those communities in need and will give them the money that they need in order to um, make the community a better and safer place. 
what I would like to see in my community would be the better use of like the green areas because we don't have really much to do around here because we have like the school and then the freeway, the desert. And if you want to go to a beach or you want to go to a park, you have to travel. Some people have to travel uh, a very long distance. You know, San Diego is known as America's finest city. San Isidro needs to finally be treated as America's finest front door. Uh, we've been treated like the back door for so long. But I think things, programs like Build Better San Diego could be the impetus uh, to us becoming that finest front door. What I would like to see in City Heights would be more plants or animals and um, less like gasoline cars that, that pollute the earth or, and more like bikes or electric cars. If this policy uh, passes, I, I would really like to see and would expect actually for um, our parks uh, to be improved, places that the youth can go. I mean, that's what I'm about. It's about having places that where the youth can uh, go and be safe. I'd like to see a lot more like, accessible trash cans because even though like littering does happen to be an individual thing, everybody plays a part in that. I believe that if there were more trash cans where people could go and like put their trash and not only small bins that every individual house has in their household, but like a bigger bin where people could put like furniture and mattresses because I tend to see that a lot on the sidewalks because not everybody has a car to be able to transport it. I think one thing that is really important in these processes is making sure that um, the government isn't just taking these simple conversation, saying, okay, we heard you, and that's enough. I think it's a lifelong relationship that should be maintained because um, trust gaps do exist between like these really big institutions and communities of color, and there's really big sad history sometimes. And so I think it's um, really important that we maintain these conversations. Um, so I'm really excited to see what comes in the future from this. My dream for my community? Yeah, I. That everybody. Everybody. That everybody. Every day. All of us. All of us. San Diego. San Diego. San Diego. All these wonderful people. All these wonderful people. The city is vibrant. All of us. All of us. All of us. We are all San Diego. We are all San Diego. We deserve this. My dream for my community. My dream for my community? That, that every, everybody, everybody, that everybody, that everybody, every day, all of us, all of us. My dream for my community. Everybody's just a little better than they everybody's were. Everybody's just before. a little better than they were the day before. Things could get better. My city, my city. Things could get better. My city, my city, my city. I love. I love San Diego. Love, love, love San Diego. <laughs> love, love San Diego. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Samira Rao, Acting Program Manager for the Planning Department. Also present with me this morning is Heidi Wamblon, Interim Director for the Planning de Department. Build Better SD is a citywide initiative to enable faster delivery of public spaces and infrastructure equitably and sustainably across San Diego. It modernizes how we plan for public infrastructure to ensure that we plan for new development and infrastructure that meet the needs of today's world today's housing, today's climate reality, and today's need to address long-standing inequities. Build Better SD includes the following main components. Shifting to citywide development impact fees to focus on more efficient completion of infrastructure where it is needed the most, including in areas where most development is occurring. 
amending the public facilities, services, and safety element of the city's general plan to align with the city's climate, equity, and housing goals, reforming regional transportation funding to streamline housing and implement the climate action plan, and finally, amending the city's land development code to facilitate implementation of regulations. The history of development impact fees in the city has been ingrained for decades and was designed for the type of development we have seen in the past, which for a long time was primarily focused on developing more suburban communities on large undeveloped land. For these largely suburban developments, it was understood that all the new infrastructure was directly needed to serve the new development. There was no existing development and therefore no other existing needs. Therefore, facilities benefit assessment that were charged to new development were intended to pay for 100% of the cost of those new facilities. However, in the city's urban areas, the city instead collected development impact fees that appropriately acknowledged that not all infrastructure needs in the community were attributable to new development. Therefore, at the time, the methodology for development impact fees was designed to in identify more limited infrastructure needs in the overall community. In all cases, whether it was called an FBA or a DIF, the money was retained in the specific community in which it was collected, only to be used for a specified static list of projects. Over time, our development patterns have shifted towards urban infill development to align with the city's climate action plan. And there is an urgent need to reform how we envision infrastructure to serve our city and to address inequities. All development impact fees are subject to the requirements set forth in the Mitigation Fee Act, which requires that fees be reasonably related to the burdens posed by new development and set forth specific monitoring and reporting requirements as well. Additionally, AB 602, which was recently adopted by the state legislature last fall, requires local agencies to update development impact fee nexus studies to apply scaled fees based on new home size by July 1, 2022. One of the reasons driving the tight timeline of this initiative is implementing state regulation related to development impact fees. AB 602 was adopted on September 28, 2021 with a compliance date of July 1, 2022, which requires that the nexus studies for development impact fees be updated and a scaled fees based on square footage of units be adopted. Build Better SD includes scaled fees based on new home size and ensures the city's compliance with this legislative mandate using a tailored approach as set forth in the accompanying nexus studies. To further compound the challenges with the city's existing fee system, the amounts of fees collected vary significantly by tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the community. Communities with lower fees have less money available to fund infrastructure and communities with higher fees present obstacles to the provision of new development, including fair housing opportunities for people of all income levels in all communities. The current system has resulted in one city, but two realities. Across the city, we see disparities in our infrastructure, including our parks, our streets, where people ride their bikes and where people walk with their children and loved ones. Build Better SD is a policy initiative focused on delivering these public facilities to people faster and more sustainably. The map on the slide shows how much investments specify specific to development impact fees vary from community to community. Communities have seen over hundred plus million dollars in investments are, where, are what were historically called FBA communities. And we see a stark contrast between this level of investment, especially when compared to cities historically underserved communities that have lower fee amounts. These issues are not just isolated to underserved communities, but to all of us. There is currently around $220 million in development impact fees spread across over 40 community funds. Some communities have fund balances as low as $27,000, while others have balances as high as $40 million. Collecting money for infrastructure is not the same 
as expending money for infrastructure. And our current structure has significantly constrained the ability to use funds collected to deliver this infrastructure to the people that live and work in our city. Under Build Better SD, existing funding already collected is required to stay in separate funds to be used in the specified community. However, with a new citywide funding source, we can begin to use the 220 million sitting in our accounts by adding to those pots of money so that we can invest these dollars in meaningful investments that will improve the lives of everyone living in our city. A citywide funding model also allows the city to comprehensively and holistically provide an infrastructure system that meets all of our needs, regardless of oftentimes arbitrary community boundary lines. As of date, there is as little as $500,000 available funding in some communities shown by the light purple on this map and over 45 million available funding in some other communities. Despite a total fund balance of over 220 million, these funds are essentially locked up. On paper, they are available, but are not in reality. Build Better SD will allow the expenditure of these funds so that we can do what we are meant to be doing spending funds rather than collecting them in accounts which serves no one. Similar to the Parks for All of Us initiative, which was adopted by City Council last summer, Build Better SD proposes city-wide fees based on asset types of mobility, fire, and libraries. This will facilitate the collection of funds in unrestricted funding pots, help deliver infrastructure quicker, prioritize investments in areas where development is greatest, in areas with the overall greatest needs and serve the greatest amount of people. The public facilities, services and safety element of the general plan provides policies on how we want to fund infrastructure and prioritize the infrastructure needed to serve our growing city. Our current policies are outdated and focused on the type of development pattern of the past. Since our climate action plan was adopted, most of our growth is in the urban core in areas located closest to the transit and in the form of infill development. It is now time to update our infrastructure policies to reflect the shift in a manner that furthers our critical need for more affordable housing and in a way that focuses on delivering infrastructure to the people that live in our city that need it the most. We are proposing to update goals and policies to answer three important questions. What kind of public spaces and infrastructures do we need for the people of San Diego? How can we sustainably fund the needed public spaces and infrastructure? How do we prioritize infrastructure in areas with the greatest growth and greatest needs? As part of the general plan amendment, we have been conducting outreach to get feedback from community organizers and residents and also engaging with high school students who these investments will affect as our future. So far, we have heard some great feedback, including that people don't want their neighborhoods to be overlooked. They want local merchants, comfortable streets to walk, accessible and connected public spaces that are safe, clean, and activated by family-friendly events. In addition to this, a survey is available on Build Better SD webpage in both Spanish and English to get a better idea of how people view public spaces in their community and get a better sense of what San Diegans want to see in the long term. So far, we have heard from over 200 people and we want to hear from more of you. This slide shows feedback we have received through the survey. For example, when asked how the city can create public spaces and buildings that are safe and accessible to people of all age groups and abilities, respondents selected safe intersections and well-lit paths as top options. Build Better SD can provide the flexibility needed to use the development impact fee funds to fund exactly these type of improvements that we are hearing you want to see. This next slide shows that when asked if the quality and quantity of public spaces and buildings are about the same in neighborhoods across the city, over 60% of respondents disagreed or strongly disagreed, which speaks to there being endless and ongoing opportunities to improve our current system. And as a final example, when asked, how we can make spaces more enjoyable. Respondents wanted to see spaces activated by people participating in sports and in community events, meaning we want to foster spaces 
that create these opportunities across the city. These preliminary responses show that our city's needs are changing and Build Better SD is intended to provide this flexibility to be able to receive continuous and ongoing community feedback on how we can best invest to serve our city. The next item, part of this Build Better SD, is reforming the Regional Transportation Congestion Improvement Program, which is abbreviated as RTCIP. Currently, we have a standard flat fee for single family and multifamily units to support this program. RTCIP is proposed to be part of the mobility fee, and the mobility fee is scaled based on unit size to ensure that development pays their proportionate share to fund regionally, regionally serving mobility and active transportation projects. To complement these efforts, the program will, up, will be updated to implement policies that prioritize biking, walking, rolling, and transit that aligns with the city's climate action goals. The current development impact fees greatly differs from one community to another. The map on the slide shows how largely the fees vary in the city. To give you an example, the development impact fee for a single family residential unit currently ranges from $2,000 to $135,000 per home across the city. Communities with very low fees generally means there is less money to invest in needed infrastructure. And communities with very high fees can be a disincentive to affordable and fair housing opportunities located primarily in the city's higher resource areas. Moving to a citywide fee will allow for more consistency and predictability. The same fee will apply to all communities, meaning the fee will increase for some communities to provide for the necessary infrastructure needed, and it will decrease in other areas, leveling the playing field for more home opportunities in all communities. Right now, there are some communities, for example, Tory Highlands, where the fee is over $135,000 per unit, and these high fee amounts make it challenging. You can even say impossible to achieve fair housing. Our fees across the city are disproportionate and there is a need for development impact fee reform. The fees are very high in some communities and very low in some communities, thus making it challenging to prioritize and fund infrastructure in a streamlined manner and address infrastructure gaps in areas with the greatest needs and development. To summarize, when fees are very low, very little infrastructure can be provided. The fees are outdated and lead to infrastructure gaps and fall short in providing necessary infrastructure needed to serve the growing city. And when fees are very high, while infrastructure can be provided, there are very few opportunities to provide for affordable housing in these high resource areas. This has resulted in wealthier communities receiving more infrastructure investments while traditionally disadvantaged communities have received significantly less funding for these spaces and services, thus creating two realities within one city. One with little infrastructure to support the growing needs and one with adequate infrastructure but less affordable housing opportunities. Build Better SD proposes a standardized citywide fee for new development to streamline public investments with an emphasis on addressing historical investment inequities and deliver, delivering infrastructure to areas with the greatest needs and areas with the greatest growth. With a shift to citywide fees, the fees will go up in certain communities where the fees have been generally artificially low for many years and will go down in communities where fees are all are currently very high to ensure equitable investments across the city. We as a city have much more work to do to achieve our equity, climate, and housing goals, and Build Better SD is one of the critical steps towards progress. As part of Build Better SD, development impact fees will be restructured from community-specific fees to citywide fees based on asset type of mobility, fire, and libraries. This is a direct follow-up to the citywide park development impact fee adopted last year. As mentioned earlier, currently, there are a combined $220 million in unspent funds because each community does not have enough money 
to fund its own existing planned projects. These existing funds will not be folded into the citywide funds. They will be spent on projects for which they were collected in accordance with the existing public facilities financing plans. Once Build Better SD is approved and adopted, the new citywide fees will be available for citywide funding structure and projects will be prioritized in areas with the greatest needs and in areas experiencing growth as development impact fees are collected to offset infrastructure needs arising due to that growth and new development. The city has developed a draft development impact fee calculator, which has been posted on our Build Better SD webpage. The calculator is going to give you the breakdown of proposed development impact fee by asset type, as well as the current diff. This is a preliminary version of the calculator designed to share information of potential ranges of fees and feedback on the fee amounts and any potential policy goals that could be addressed through the final fee amount is welcome and appreciated. San Diego's municipal code will be amended to implement Build Better SD policies to again streamline the delivery of more infrastructure to more people much sooner. The code changes include providing an update to the payment of housing impact fee section to align it with the recent code update that requires development impact fees to be paid prior to final inspection instead of building permit issuance. Clarifying that while development impact fee for residential development shall be locked in when application is submitted or when the fee is paid prior to final inspection, whichever is lower in accordance with SB 330, and that for all other development, development impact fee shall be locked in at building permit issuance or when the fee is paid prior to final inspection, whichever is lower. For a development that chooses to provide an on-site improvement in accordance with the list of identified projects in the Mobility Nexus study to the satisfaction of the city engineer, the applicant will be eligible for 90% waiver of the mobility diff and finally, for development reimbursement agreements, if the development impact fees in the specific fund are exhausted, the applicant may be eligible to apply for a credit based on asset type of mobility or parks towards the citywide mobility development impact fund and citywide park development impact fee fund. Build Better SD also includes an amendment to the land development manual to provide consistency and predictability for applicants in determining impact fees. Build Better SD represents some big changes in the way we collect and expand fees in an effort to deliver more infrastructure to more people across the city and to allow the city to efficiently prioritize funding where the needs are the greatest. Along with these changes, other things will remain. The department will continue to regularly monitor and report on development impact fee accounts and expenditures. And community groups will continue to provide priority lists of projects for consideration in the CIP budget process. And as community plans are updated, the planning department will also work closely with the community to identify infrastructure needs. All of these priority projects would then have access to a larger funding source, citywide fees, so that we can actually spend the money we collect to bring much needed investments to completion. Just a quick note about Otay Mesa. For fire and library fees, Otay Mesa would become part of the citywide fee system, just as it is presently under the citywide park development impact fees. As you know, Otay Mesa serves a critical role in connecting the city regionally. It is also a community that remains less built out than other communities throughout the city. Due to the unique nature of the mobility needs in Otay Mesa, while it is anticipated that regionally serving infrastructure in Otay Mesa would be a part of the citywide fee system, a separate dedicated funding source for more locally serving mobility infrastructure is needed to provide for Otay's unique mobility needs. Therefore, development in Otay would continue to pay the mobility portion of the Otay Mesa specific fee except that the regionally serving improvements would be captured through the citywide portion of, the, of its payment. At this time, it is not anticipated that the amounts of the fee due in Otay Mesa would vary significantly from the existing fees due. 
we will continue to work with the OTI Mesa community throughout implementation to ensure the continual monitoring of the fees to carefully balance the needs of the community. The planning department held three intergenerational workshops at Ocean Discovery Institute at City Heights, San Ysidro Library and Skyline Library, along with workshops at Morris, Hoover and San Ysidro High Schools. A virtual citywide workshop conducted on March 10th was attended by over 70 people from across the city. Build Better SD will be heard at Active Transportation and Infrastructure Committee on April 6th with City Council as um, to be followed. The Mitigation Fee Act requires annual re reporting of the development impact fees and accordingly, we will continue to monitor the funds on an annual basis. Finally, the development impact fees that have already been collected in the community specific funds will continue to be spent on projects for which the fees were collected. Once the initiative is adopted by city council and revenue is generated in the citywide fund based on the asset type of mobility, fire and libraries, planning department will collaborate and coordinate with asset owning departments to prioritize investments across the city based on the greatest need and greatest development on an annual basis. Item was presented at CPC on Tuesday and CPC unanimous, unanimously voted for additional time to review the item and provide feedback before it can be taken through the public hearing process. Staff recommends that planning commission recommend city council adoption of the initiative with proposed changes to provide clarification language regarding the time at which the development impact fee will be locked in in accordance with SB 330. Thank you so much. That concludes the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a very detailed presentation. Um, let's go to clarification questions. Do we have any clarification? Uh, Commissioner Boomhauer. Thank you uh, and staff, that was a very thorough presentation. So I appreciate that. I, I do have uh, a number of clarification questions actually. Um, and yes, Chair Hoffman, I promised their clarification questions. Thank you. Um, so we currently have 44 communities that that have diff lock boxes. Do we know what percentage of those communities are going to see increased fees? You, you talked about the range. I know the low end it's a thousand, at the upper end it's 135k. But but do we have an idea of what? Like, like, do we do we know of the forty four communities? How many of them are numerically going to see increases? Um, I, I uh, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the question, Heidi Von Blum, interim planning director. Um, I'll Samira might be able to get uh, you the specific numbers of communities that are seeing increases, but I do want to frame it a little bit. Um, the fee increases do range, you know, from a small amount to some um, a larger amount, and then the communities. Uh, where the fees are going down, um, typically are seeing larger decreases. Um, as Samira had uh, pointed out in her presentation, the fees across the city vary widely uh, from as low as zero dollars you know, per, per home in some communities and over $100,000 in other communities. Um, overall, um, in the areas where we see the most development occurring, um, those are typically the communities that have the lowest fees in place. This is uh, sort of a reversal of the way that we used to see things um, when we had the higher fees in the communities where we were seeing the most growth occurring. Um, so as far as the specific numbers, um, Samir, I don't have, I don't know if you have the specific number of how many of those 44 communities um, are experiencing increases, although um, it is um, over half of the communities. Yeah, I would say over half. I don't have a specific number, but I can get back with that information. Okay, thank you. And then, and, and when you get back to us with that information, why don't you go ahead and let us know how many of those are communities of concern? Because I think that's going to be an important part of this as well. Um, it, either, I guess, increasing or decreasing. But my guess is that in communities of concern, it's almost always going to be an increase. Primarily, we do expect to see increases in communities of concern. I, I do want to you know, frame, frame uh, the context a little bit more. Um, 
where there are some increases um, in communities that are communities of concern, that is not always a bad thing. Um, very high fees um, constrain our opportunities for fair housing uh, because it uh, diminishes the opportunities for affordable housing in those higher resourced areas. Um, on the flip side, uh, very low fees um, do not provide significant revenue source to provide investments um, in the communities that are experiencing the growth, especially in the communities of concern as well. I hear you and we will get back to that when we actually get into commission discussion. Um, so, Ms. Rao, in your presentation, did I hear you correctly when you, did you state that the mobility fee would be scaled by unit size? Because I didn't actually see that anywhere in the documentation that was provided to us. Um, yeah, so that, so that is correct. You don't see the specific numbers in your documentation. Um, the general plan amendment and the amendments to the land development manual, as well as the land development code, are the items before the Planning Commission today. The specific um, nexus studies and fee resolutions are not um, before the Planning Commission, although they are a part of the entire package. So we do understand um, that there is an interest in the amount of fees, which is why we have tried to provide as much information as possible to provide the larger context to it. There is a calculator that is referenced in the staff report and on our website um, that provides um, a very detailed breakdown um, of what the fees are based on the scaled unit sizes. You know what? There's no way for me to even engage with that without getting into discussion. So I will just wait for that. Thank you. Those are my clarifying questions, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miyahara uh, and Commissioner, no, no need. It's good, but I can't see it very well. But whenever you want to speak um, on clarification, just raise your hands. I can see that easier, but uh, please go right ahead. And before you start, because you're a new member uh, and as Commissioner Boomhauer uh, was alluding to, uh, the clarification questions are just that clarification. And what we're trying to do is, is clarify what staff, what's in the staff report, et cetera and refrain at this point in time to express our opinions or likes or dislikes, and it's just getting clarification. So sorry, that's the last time I'll say that to, to you guys. And then when we get into com commission discussion is the time where you can bring up all of your concerns, but please go ahead. Sure. Um, first question is um, this week's meeting at community planning group. Um, what, uh, any major questions, concerns that were raised, obviously they didn't um, vote to move this along. Um, curious about um, what discussions took place at that meeting. Um, I can take that question. So I think there were a variety of questions. Uh, there was, uh, you know, there was interest in understanding how much the fees is going up in which communities. Um, there was also uh, an interest in understanding how this would get implemented uh, after adoption as to what the role of different community groups would be and how they will be able to prioritize projects in which areas. I think um, they, they're just like looking for additional information about how this will be implemented. And we did respond back saying, we will come back uh, once the item is adopted with an implementation plan. But other than that, their ask was for additional time to review documents and provide additional feedback. Thank you. Um, totally get that this is a new law that went into effect um, just this year, that there's a clock on it um, and that it's time sensitive, needs to get approved by July 1st. Um, question as it relates to the Nexus studies. I know that those um, appear to be in draft form on the SD uh, Build Better landing page. Um, they weren't included in our reports, but anything to note um, there in regards to um, you know, the nexus uh, and report findings uh, for um, the proposal here. Yeah, the nexus studies uh, will be finalized as they continue um, through the hearing process at council committee as well as the city council. Uh, we also do have, um, for when we um, have more detailed questions um, and comments um, from the commissioners, our consultants um, with intersecting metrics and EFS engineering available to answer questions specifically on the Nexus studies as well. Thank you. Um, and the last uh, clarifying question I have is um, impacts the, uh, the current um, capital improvement programs for 
specific areas. Uh, is, has that been contemplated um, for this year or, or next year? Can you talk a little bit about um, how that, that uh, this proposal rolls into those individual plans and um, timing of that, how that's been contemplated um, and, and how projects will be prioritized? Yeah, so this particular item does not include the identification of specific projects to be funded um, through the annual um, budget process, including for the annual CIP budget process in particular. Uh, there will be access to, under this program, the larger pool of citywide funds uh, for the communities to be able to prioritize their projects. It, it is a very complicated um, and complex system, um, especially when we have been used to having 44 different funds for so long. One of the significant benefits um, as we tried to provide in our presentation is that rather than having access to funds where oftentimes um, very few communities are able to um, actually see their projects and their priorities funded, there will be a much um, better access to a much larger pool of funds so that more community priorities that are identified through the community planning groups and other stakeholders um, have a much higher chance of um, being funded with this larger pool of citywide funds. Thank you. Um, Chair Hoffman, that's all the uh, questions I have right now. All right, thank you. Any other clarification questions? Commissioner Malbro. Uh, yeah, I just had one quick one. Um, I think Heidi actually mentioned it. Uh, so in the um, Build Better SD attachment, page 16, you talked about identifying priorities and you did say uh, using the use of CPGs and interested stakeholders. And I just, would you give me an example of what an interested stakeholder would be for this process? Yeah, so CPGs are certainly um, one form of community input that the city receives and um, when it identifies priorities in our in our budget, um, but they are certainly not the only um, stakeholders that are um, um, encouraged to participate in that budget process. Um, so we see lots of community based organizations and stakeholders throughout the community um, that participate in our, our process every year. Um, and we do you know, want to remind everybody and encourage everybody then, um, yes, the community planning groups um, are a location um, where where we do have um, at, you know, access to that input uh, for community planning group priorities, um, but definitely um, want to um, encourage other community groups to advocate um, for their needs and desires in the community as well. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, no other hands. Um, I do have some clarification questions, uh, but they will definitely extend into discussion. So I'm gonna hold off till we begin planning commission discussion. Um, so if there's no other clarification questions, we will now, well, first of all, let me by a show of any hands, and it only takes one, uh, does anyone, would anyone like to take a break on the commission? Okay, we will take a, a 10 minute break. Let's uh, reconvene at, um, well, actually can uh, Commissioner Boomer work in seven minutes, will that do it for you? Can we reconvene at, uh, 1020, let's reconvene at 1020.
All right, we will reconvene just as soon as I see all of our commissioners back. That looks like everybody. So we are now at the public testimony uh, portion. I will open it up for public testimony. Uh, and if you'd like to speak on this item, please click on your raised hand icon on your computer screen. Um, and I just wanna get a, I'd like everyone to raise their hand. I just gotta, I wanna get a head count of how many speakers we have. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna allow each speaker uh, three minutes uh, for to provide testimony and we will start with James Ryan. And James, I, uh, it looks like you just muted yourself by accident. Okay, James, hold on. Let's, uh, we'll go back to you. Let's uh, go to Dana uh, Gibbett. And again, Dana, you are muted as well. I am unmuted now, yes? Yes, you are. Thank go you. ahead, you'll have three minutes. Thank Please. you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I submitted a bunch of questions to the planning department on February 21st, um, trying to understand this. Uh, I've received some responses, uh, but they have been incomplete. So I would like to raise the questions again here. Um, first, uh, what formulae and data will the city be using to determine which communities are most in need for each of the infrastructure areas at any point in time, because of course this will change as investments are made in communities over time. Will that data and those formulae be made public? Uh, the fact sheet talks about, quote, addressing historical investment inequities, unquote. How will those historical investment inequities be quantified and what part will they play in the formulae the city is creating? for the fair and consistent application of this proposed new program. Who will be responsible for applying the formulae for each type of infrastructure for each community to rank order the communities with the greatest need? How will this information be made available to the public on an ongoing basis to ensure transparency and fairness? From your email, I understand there will be three funds, mobility, fire, and library. Library is self-explanatory, but the first two areas are less so. For the mobility and fire funds, please identify what infrastructure areas each fund will include. For example, does mobility include biking, sidewalks, hiking trails, and roads? What if a community is blessed with great bike lanes and horrible sidewalks? It seems lumping those together would obscure the relative needs from community to community given the range of different mobility modes. For fire, are we talking about new fire stations or is new equipment part of this fund, personnel, et cetera? Thank you very much for your time. And I hope that staff will address these questions because I think they would be of interest to the commission, the public and the city council. Thank you. Okay, Dana, thank you. Uh, James Ryan, um, you are still muted, but let's give it another shot. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, so my name is James Ryan. Uh, I am the chair of the San Diego American Society of Landscape Architects Climate Action Committee. Um, and I have a few questions um, pertaining to this uh, program. Um, first, I'd like to applaud you all. I think this is great. Uh, and I think the uh, Social equity that's being maintained here or, or being proposed here is great. Um, but I did want to ask um, how gentrification was going to be considered in the new investment that was going to occur in some of these lower income communities and how you were going to kind of uh, make sure that uh, these um, long term residents weren't pushed out because of this newfound investment. Thank you. 
Thank you. Jeff Dosik. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? I uh, sure can. Yeah, great, thanks. I live in University City, and part of what I wanted to address or make a point is on the mobility with regard to the climate action goals. Um, University City, when it was built, um, was built with very good bike lanes. But over time, for the last 10 or 15 years, um, those bike lanes have gotten chopped up, especially at the intersections because there's so much growth here in University City. And it seems when I bring the mobility up and safe bike lanes, they're just not connected any longer. And you have a university and you have tremendous amount of growth going in here in University City that are for great jobs, but there doesn't seem to be the mechanism in everything that's talked about that these bike lanes are, are connected any longer. And I'm referring to Governor Drive, Eastgate Mall, Genesee and Regents Road. In the last year, two people have been killed riding bikes. There's an illusion of safety. And why I'm bringing this issue up here is there, there's, there's a belief that University City in this area of San Diego has great bike lanes. And people, when they look at it, they say, oh, I see lots of bike lanes, but nobody's using them. Well, that's because the traffic engineers at the intersections, because there's so much car traffic, have literally just painted over the bike lanes for turn lanes for cars. And um, I, I would hope that the city engineers and you people on the commission would recognize that and keep that in context. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sally Small. Hello, thank you again. I'm with the Choice Valley, excuse me, community. Um, can I, can you come back to me? <laughs> sure. Me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we'll come back. Just keep your hand raised. Um, next speaker, uh, phone number ends in 5559. And please, uh, I know you spoke before, but please identify yourself with your full name again, please. Um, yes, hi, my name is Matt Wallstrom. Um, I spoke earlier. Um, I am on the board of Uptown Planners. Um, and uh, I just, a slickly produced video is no substitute to legitimate public participation. Uh, the specifics of this initiative were revealed only a few weeks ago and first presented to the Community Planners Committee just two days ago and they requested being provided the time necessary to be able to adequately review the massive changes proposed to our general plan and the land development code. It is a requirement of this commission to consider the input of the community planning groups in making its determinations. Input that the current timeline to meet an arbitrary deadline has not allowed. It is chilling that you are being asked in the name of equity and inclusion to make a decision that specifically deprives San Diegans of both. There is nothing to be gained and too much to be lost by approving or denying recommending this to the city council today. I implore you to exercise your duty of care to postpone this vote in order to ensure full and transparent public participation has been made possible. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Sally, are you ready to try it again? Yes, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Still going though. Um, I agree totally with Matt from Uptown Planners and appreciate the questions that were given by uh, Dana Gibbett. Um, yes, I agree. I was also at, at the CPC a Zoom meeting, and it was very clear that there were way too many questions and not enough answers that were given. We appreciated the 
the uh, slideshow as as you were given, uh, not the uh, slick presentation, but the main one. Um, I've attended the Build uh, Better SD workshops, uh, and there wasn't enough information coming out to the public that was accessible, and so that people didn't quite understand what it really means to them in their communities. And I happen to be in an area that's communities of concern. And they're thinking, wait a minute, if the diff money uh, that already exists stays with those communities and it's only half of us, or, or excuse me, 50% uh, of the money would be going to communities of concern if we have increased population uh, needs as well, we're only getting, um, almost only getting, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, affordable housing in our neighborhoods and very few uh, at market rate. So we're not getting diff money anyways. And then of course there's the ADU situation where our infrastructure is already poor. It's gonna take a long time for it to get back up. We don't even have uh, sidewalks and storm drains in our neighborhood, let alone uh, good streets, etc. Thanks. I appreciate you listening, especially through this croaking. <laughs> okay, you did great, Sally. Thank you. Um, let's go to the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition, and could the speaker go ahead and identify himself or herself? Hi, good morning. This is uh, Will Radigan with the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition. Uh, I would like to express our strong support for Build Better SD. For far too long, inequalities in development impact fees between neighborhoods have led to massive disparities in the quality of infrastructure available to San Diego's communities. In no area is this problem more apparent than road maintenance and infrastructure. While neighborhoods experiencing more development have freshly paved roads, safer bike infrastructure, and modern crosswalks, Less recently developed neighborhoods have roads so poorly maintained as to be unsafe, almost no bike infrastructure at all, and dangerous and outdated sidewalks and crosswalks. All San Diegans deserve streets and sidewalks that are safe and comfortable for all modes of transportation. Especially as San Diego works to rapidly expand its network of bicycle infrastructure, it's essential that all neighborhoods have access to equal infrastructure funding. This initiative will help make that a reality. Uh, and finally, I'd like to disagree with the previous two commenters who stated that there has been insufficient public outreach on this initiative. I have attended the public outreach sessions for this initiative and was very impressed by the detail presented by the outreach team and by their thought thoughtful responses to public comments and questions. Uh, we urge the Planning Commission to approve this initiative today. San Diego should not have to wait any longer for a development impact fee structure that allows all neighborhoods to benefit equally from city funding. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I muted there. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew Adams. And Matt, you're, there you go. Thank you, good morning, Matthew Adams from the San Diego County Building Industry Association. I wanted to just touch briefly on a couple of uh, issues in regards to Build Better San Diego, which as the regulated community, we are generally supportive of this concept. Uh, let's bear in mind that there's over $200 million that is sitting unused in existing accounts because of an outdated system. And this effort to modernize the process is essential for San Diego's future. And it's one that uh, we are supportive of, uh, provided that it is implemented effectively and implemented fairly. Some of the concerns that we have deal with how this we will transition from the existing system to the new system. And we are supportive of uh, using a similar process that was done last year when they moved to implement the citywide park fee. We found that process to be uh, agreeable and it uh, worked to minimize the economic impacts that will come in some of these communities that are going to see some uh, fee increases. We've run the uh, the diff calculator and it, and it shows that over 80% of the communities are going to see some sort of uh, increase in fees as a consequence of this. So 
we would like to see the same kind of language that was used in the citywide park fee included in this process as well, because that seemed to uh, mitigate some of the concerns uh, that we had had and do it both for residential and non-residential uh, development. Uh, we think that's very uh, important because you know, the industry is, uh, you know, as my letter said, the industry faces stiff uh, headwinds right now with uh, escalating costs and things. And this could uh, add to some of the problems that we're having. And all of this, uh, all of this uh, has us trying to uh, work to create middle income housing, something that uh, we struggle to for a variety of reasons. And we want to make sure that the playing field is fair so we can attempt to provide this sorely needed product of middle income housing. And I wanted to thank uh, Heidi and her staff. They've been extremely accessible. They've been tremendously informative. And uh, it has uh, really uh, been helpful to us as we've worked to examine this and why we are generally supportive of Build Better San Diego. Our essential issue is to ensure that the transition is something that uh, does not adversely affect the cost to produce housing. Uh, and uh, we would ask that uh, you uh, support that uh, suggestion as well, so we can move forward and have this program implemented. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul Jamison. And there you go. Yeah, I'm Paul Jamison. I wanted to express my support for Build Better San Diego. I missed Samara's presentation today, sorry, Samira, but I did see her presentation at the CPC. So thank you very much for that. We have really historic inequities in San Diego, which uh, in my opinion are worsening now. We sort of have soaring uh, inequality. Uh, we really do need safe last mile connections from transit to housing, uh, and I think that this program would help enable that funding by targeting those areas. Um, you know, and the ways to get from that transit to the housing would potentially be via bike lanes or pedestrian improvements. Really, let's try not to induce more vehicle miles by widening roads. You know, right now, most of the city roads are still really designed by traffic engineers focused on moving motorists and cars quickly and that's often at the expense of people on foot or bicyclists so this really would provide new funding for alternative transit infrastructure which is in line with the city's climate action plan mode share goals you know for many years the downtown mobility bike plan was as far as i know the only city funded bike lane project um, apart from sort of repaving and restriping of bike lanes so it's been a challenge to find funding for these uh, bike lane programs um, the mayor's office now has a small amount of money budgeted for a small number of quick action bike lane plans, but there's been these challenges of hiring engineers, you know, it's a very difficult uh, hiring environment and the city struggles to find talent with its current budget. So anywhere we can find uh, resources that can we can dedicate towards this would be great. Um, I just want to finish up by saying that um, at the CPC meeting, you know, we didn't hear from any of the demographics who would really be most helped by these changes. It was really just older white folks, including myself, largely from wealthier communities that spoke, and none of them really showed any real interest in the equity goals of the program. It was more about defending the status quo and, and their community. Now, I strongly believe every Everyone should have a voice, but we still have these fundamental problems of representation within CPC and CPGs, and I hope that we can reform those too. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Urban Collaborative Project, and if you could, the speaker could go ahead and identify himself. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Sure. Hello? Yeah, we can hear, hear you. Me? Can you identify yourself? Yes, we can. Hello? <laughs> we, we can hear you. Can you oh, hear us? I think, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on a Sandag meeting as well. You know, I overall really- uh, Could you go ahead and identify yourself? Sure, Barry Pollard with the Urban Collaborative Project in Southeastern San Diego. Thank you. And, and I've been sort of tracking all of these different um, entities that are addressing equity. I, I think I think we could really make a significant impact if we did our targeting in redlined areas in the city of San Diego. I'm, I'm listening to all of these big 
programs and raising the diff fees, you know, that, that's going to be helpful. Um, and, and then I, I don't expect an answer today, but I would certainly like to know why that area that was so focused upon to keep investment out of our communities for years with the redlined area, it was adhered to almost like Bible and implemented almost like Bible. It was policy. And yet when it comes to an opportunity as this is and the equity lens conversations that we have a really good opportunity to, to be targeted in the areas that we know needs infrastructure, that we know needs resources and services. And yet I see very little in this program that would address that specifically. So, I mean, I want you to think about that. I think Commissioner Boonhauer, when he was talking, was alluding to the equity and raising diff fees all over, this, all over the city. That's gonna impact some communities more than others, ours. And yet we don't seem to see the level of enthusiasm to correct what's been done. We're always gonna be behind the eight ball, you guys. We're always going to be behind. If there's not a focused, concerted effort to address specific areas within San Diego. So that's my, I just said the same thing in Sandag, you guys. So don't think that you're alone. And, and I want us to start thinking about that. It's almost like we're embarrassed of redlining and we're not even gonna talk about it. It's like a bad word. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much for your, for your, uh, for your efforts. Um, we'll be talking again as the outreach continues. Set, and the last thing I wanted to mention is it would be nice if we can have, and I haven't looked at the schedule of outreach, it would really be nice if we had one of these meetings after five because you're missing a whole lot of people that are working. Okay, thank you. Thank you're you welcome. very much. All right, that looks like it concludes all of our speakers. Uh, so with that, I will close the public testimony portion uh, and we'll go right to planning commission discussion. Um, and I'm gonna go a little bit out of order. I, I just wanna, bring up my clarification questions because I think it will go into a little bit of discussion and I, I want the commission to uh, talk about this. Um, but the clarification question is, I'm trying to figure out what our role here is on this recommendation. Uh, my understanding is, and staff correct me if I'm wrong, that we're making a recommendation on a very significantly different impact fee infrastructure. Uh, we're, we're not developing the fee, totally get that, that that'll be developed by others, so the actual fee, but the infra, we're making a recommendation, are we not on these, a new impact fee infrastructure that really goes from a localized community plan oriented to a citywide? That is correct. So the Build Better SD framework, which is before the Planning Commission in the form um, primarily through the General Plan Amendment, provides the framework for a new funding system to fund um, citywide infrastructure to support growth in the city. Okay, um, and, and and that's was my understanding as well. I just wanted to make it clear. Uh, and, and maybe it's a little bit of a follow-up to Commissioner Miyahara's uh, uh, clarification questions, but going a little deeper, uh, the thing that, that I'm uncomfortable with is that we're being asked to make a recommendation on a very new infrastructure for impact fees, but yet we were not given the ability to see the nexus studies to see, in fact, is there a legal, a rough proportionality um, related to actual development impacts that study to, to at least make me feel more comfortable that we're not making a recommendation on something that uh, may be legally flawed and open to legal challenge. Um, I know that impact fees normally don't go through us. It goes straight to the city council and that's usually the, the 
the procedure is to do the nexus study ahead of city council. But in this case, since we are making a recommendation on a very brand new, um, very different system, uh, and nexus studies are being done, but yet we don't have the ability to, to look at those before we make our recommendation. So, and it's not really, it's my concern. And if you could address that, that'd be great. Maybe I'm out of line here, but um, I am an impact fee practitioner. I have been my entire career. Um, and that, that's so vitally important to make sure we can make the findings for the proper nexus. Um, so I'm gonna have trouble uh, but I want to hear other commissioners' uh, comments about it and, and staff as well um, going forward with this without getting a chance to at least, maybe I won't need to study it, but it, but it, it can be explained to me um, what, those, what that nexus study, what those findings are. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I know I'm a little bit out of turn, but I just wanted to raise that question um, as we um, go through the discussion. Sure, if I can quickly provide a response to that. Um, the sure. Nexus studies um, are provided on our city website. Um, I understand that they were not included in the Planning Commission materials. Um, however, we have worked um, with our um, consultants that are available to answer specific questions as it relates um, to the required Nexus. We have also worked closely with the city attorney's office um, to develop the Nexus studies. Um, and I'll defer to the city attorney um, if uh, she has anything to add. Thank you. Um, well, I would actually give me, thank you for that opening. Um, I would like to ask the attorney's office um, and I did give them pre-warning um, that uh, in your opinion, since you have reviewed the Nexus studies, can we, with this new system, can we make a legal, uh, a finding that, that we meet that legal test? Uh, for a proper nexus. So thank you for that question. Um, as um, staff has indicated, those studies are not finalized yet. Um, we have worked with staff and will continue to work with staff to ensure that those fees meet all of the legal requirements. Um, as you noted, you are not being asked to um, take action on those fees. You are asked to take action on the policies and the framework surrounding those fees. So then it's really then not, and that's what I was getting at before, it's really maybe not appropriate for us to worry about the nexus, even though this is a, a massive change to our existing impact fee infrastructure. I'll, I'll let Corinne answer that question um, more specifically, but um, I do also just uh, want to chime in that the Nexus studies are largely consistent with the methodology that was used for the citywide park development impact fee, uh, which you saw in a similar fashion last year um, with the framework of the parks master plan, as well as an amendment to the recreation element of the general plan. Um, but again, that Nexus study was not before the planning commission. Um, however, um, we did continue to work with the city attorney's office as that item was brought forward. And the methodology for these fees uh, largely is similar and follows that format. And if you recall, I, I think I made the same objection. I do recall that. <laughs> okay, I, I'll leave it there and let's go to the rest of the commission discussion. Commissioner Boomhauer. Thank you. So I, I guess I need to start this by saying that I am, look, I love the policy idea. Okay, we clearly we have an equity issue Clearly, communities of concern have not been getting the investment from impact fees as, as other communities have been getting because they don't have those funds. Um, the, I, I agree with several of the public commenters who said the system is broken. We need to fix it. And I feel like I have to say that because if I didn't, the rest of my comments are going to come off cross kind of with me like being a jerk especially after we got to watch that really awesome video. So my concern isn't so much with the policy itself. Okay, I get it. We, we, need, to get, we need to break the lockboxes. We need to get this where we have citywide funds. 
that's fantastic. And I get that we're not specifically being asked to comment or approve the fees that city council's purview and God bless them, I don't wanna go there. But anybody that's watched planning commission for the time I've been on it knows that I'm always concerned about unintended consequences. And without having an understanding of how how big these fees are going to be, and and let's be clear, and I share Chair Hoffman's concern about what was given to us and what wasn't, and what's on the website, and being told, well, it's on the website, which, by the way, like a lot of our wonky planning department websites, is basically impossible to navigate unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Um, that's more an IT web design issue, but. I mean, okay, it's there. I went, I found it, I played with it. And I'm not a math guy. I'm an architect and an attorney. Neither of those are professions known for being math whizzes. And I certainly meet that stereotype. But as I'm playing with this, I'm coming up with the fact that we're going to be seeing citywide fees running like 10 grand a unit. And my concern is, are we... In, in an effort to try to equitably deal with infrastructure and develop and, and make sure that we're reinvesting in every community, especially in communities of concern, are we putting ourselves in a position where it's gonna be impossible for new development to take place in those communities of concern because we're not gonna be able, developers aren't gonna be able to get the project to actually pencil in order to work in those neighborhoods because the impact fees are going to increase to the point which means that that's going to have to pass along to final sale price or final rents which are going to put those units either out of reach of the people that need them in those communities or more likely make the project not pencil because they're not going to be able to the developer is not going to be able to get investor support or lending support based on area rents and area median income. And so while I recognize, and the Chief Deputy Newfer, I am trying very hard to make sure I'm staying in our swim lane here. I recognize that the fees aren't what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be looking at the general plan amendments and, and the pieces that are in front of us. But I have a really hard time, just, just with the information that's been provided to us, sitting there and saying, yep, this is great. And it's not that I don't trust staff. I, I absolutely understand, Ms. Von Bloom, what you're saying, that you know, you've, the Nexus studies are in process, you're working with consultants, staff is working on this, the city attorney's office is involved. That, that's my expectation. I have no problem with that. I get that that's how we do business. But if my name is going to be on something that's going in front of council saying that we support this, I need to have a much higher confidence level that we're not creating, a, we're not trying to solve one problem and creating another bigger one that we're going to have to live with for a very long time. So I'm really conflicted. I, I mean, part of me wants to sit there and say, yep, sure, let's go with it. I like the policy. This is great. But I, I have so many unanswered questions that I just, and, and let's be clear, it's awesome, again, Ms. Von Bloom, that you have the, the consultants on here that can answer specific questions about fees in the Nexus study, but we haven't seen the Nexus study. I can't ask specific questions. I just don't know enough. So I'm, I'm willing to sit back and listen to what the rest of the commission has to say, but I, I got to tell you, I, and this doesn't happen very often, but man, I think CPC's got this one right. I think we need to, to think about continuing this item to a date certain and giving staff a chance to have us ask some questions, you know, today, have staff have an opportunity to come back to us with additional information and uh, allow us to really have a thoughtful, informed conversation and that, that allows us to, to hopefully get to a point where we can support this, but I'm just not there now. 
Um, so those are my comments, Chair Hoffman. I reserve the right to speak again in the second round based on what everyone else says. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miyahara. And uh, there you go. Yep. Let me start by saying, um, I'm gonna turn my camera off. For some reason, my camera's pulsating today, so excuse me. Um, I'll start by saying that, you know, this is solid policy. I like the framework. Um, I think staff did an excellent job at that. Uh, I say that because, you know, the intent and updates to the elements of the general plan, muni code, uh, development manual, and the local coast program are designed to meet the evolving needs uh, of various communities, uh, which will result in the quality of life, better quality of life for a lot of San Diegans. I think the initiative strives to create equitable dis distribution um, of our public facilities, infrastructure, and services throughout all communities. And I can appreciate uh, the fact that we're focusing on areas with the greatest needs, especially in communities uh, with the greatest levels of new development. Um, the city is more or less built out, um, and this acknowledges most new development is urban infill. Uh, that will require new infrastructure. Um, and it prioritizes infrastructure in areas with the greatest growth. Um, the questions and concerns that I have is, uh, you know, the, the transparency at this point over, you know, the fee distributions amongst different communities uh, and uh, concerns over, you know, what those impacts might be. I think that the policy and the framework is great. Um, I, I feel as though I don't have enough information uh, at this point, at least today, knowing what those impacts might be. Um, uh, I will take a look at the you know, fee schedule calculator on the uh, Build Better San Diego web uh, landing page. Um, I think the link in the report was broken, um, uh, but uh, the, the main concerns really are um, will this create unintended consequences? Um, you know, speaking for a developer that builds affordable housing, we're often exempt from um, some of these fees. But what I can share with you is that um, uncertainty and, and cost impacts definitely um, elevate levels of risk, um, can sometimes uh, impact projects in a major way. And so what I'd like to do is, you know, just have a better handle on you know, the distri distribution of fees across different communities and, um, you know, comparing, contrasting current fee schedule versus uh, what these changes really mean um, to each of those communities. Um, uh, that, those are my comments. All right, thank you. Um, and I accidentally very apologize going in alphabetical order. I skipped right over Commissioner Malbro and please, Commissioner, go right ahead. Uh, no problem. Thank you, Chair. So, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that the city is officially recognizing the inequities that have gone on uh, in, our, in some of our communities. Uh, and I'm very happy about that. But, um, and, and I think this program at some point can work, but I don't know how I cannot be worried about the impact fees. And I'm sorry, city attorney, you're probably gonna get mad at me about that, but that is a concern. Um, I happen to live in a community and I chair the planning group where we have a lot of, we have a couple of uh, uh, TPAs in that area and we have a lot of area to, to develop, but yet there's no line for it. There isn't any line for it. And what I worry about raising of these fees that might be a continuation of that, that problem, especially of market rate development. How, how are they gonna be able to do something of that, that nature? What I would like to see is a lot of times we put these programs together, but we don't have a mechanism to see how it's doing over a period of time. And I think that's, that might be a missing element for this program to see, in fact, when it does go into, go into work, how is it doing? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Is it having impacts on other things like development? And so I would kind of support what uh, I've heard so far is maybe we need to have an opportunity to, to look at it a little deeper and have more conversation. But 
I am on your side. I want to see this work because it's a needed program. But I want to make sure that we have all the boxes checked to make sure that it is going to do what it's supposed to do and not have other impacts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Modé. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm happy to hear that the rest of the commissioners have a very similar point of view as I did when I read through this packet. Um, I'm really, really happy to see this come forward. I, I want the planning department, um, Heidi and Samira to know that I think this is really important for our city overall. Um, and I know for a very long time that these funds have been locked up and we can't seem to get enough for one community to actually do anything with the money that's, that's sitting in the account. So to put it into one account, I think is um, tremendously beneficial um, for our city moving forward, especially with our aging infrastructure. Um, I do also have serious concerns about the fee Im implications of this. Um, we are, you know, we're in an infrastructure, you know, uh, it, we, we have infrastructure issues, but we also have a significant housing crisis. And it really comes down to supply and demand. And it is extremely hard to get things to um, be financially feasible where we could actually go get it financed um, right now with rising interest rates, commodity prices going just, you know, through the roof. And then we're getting layered in um, additional fees. So I'm concerned that we, we're only getting a portion of the picture here. It's like getting a, you know, the, the first 10 chapters of a book and asking to, to write a critique on the entire thing. Um, it's really hard for me to do that, especially since I'm in the throes of this and I underwrite deals all the time. And, um, you know, the money makes an impact and, and we really need to get more housing up and um, adding costs to projects um, right now is, is, not, is not good for that effort. Um, so I would like to see uh, the next study. I know that you said it was posted, but I look at the packets that I get and I try to use that as the framework for my decisions. And I don't wanna go and hunt and peck for other information. Um, I have looked at the calculator. I don't wanna speak about it because it was not actually part of our packet. I did find that almost most communities are gonna have an impact upwards on fees. Um, but I think it would be appropriate for us to see that next study. I also think it would be appropriate for the community planning groups to have a little more time to digest this um, and provide feedback. Um, so I would like to ask for a continuance so we can see those two items and look at this um, item holistically. Know that the framework and the policy I'm 100% supportive on, um, but I think that we're it's a little bit of a black box right now on those fees. I'd also like to understand how we can unlock that 200 million or however much it is that is um, in all those various accounts and use um, another effort to see how we can um, extract those funds into one account. I think we need to work on that simultaneously so that we can um, address some of the infrastructure concerns and not just you know, impact developers with fees on when they're already trying to make deals work. Um, I'd like to see if we can work in tandem on that as well. That's my comments. Uh, did, did I hear a motion in there somewhere? Yes, I'd like to, I, I don't know the proper way of saying this. Um, maybe the city attorney can help me, but I would like to um, have a motion to continue the item you know, so that we can have the next study and maybe the draft fee table um, included as part of this packet so we can look at it um, in totality. If I could um, chime in also, um, you have two items that are in front of you for recommendation that have um, timelines on them under the municipal code, um, under the general plan as a land use plan. If you do not make a recommendation within 45 days of this initial hearing, it is deemed um, a recommendation for approval uh, with the land development code amendment. If you do not make a recommendation within 60 days, um, it can move on to city council without a recommendation. So I would recommend if you do um, want to continue it, to continue it um, to a date certain within those 45 days from today. Okay. 
Great, thank you, Prince. Um, so I would make a motion to continue the item to, you know, a meeting in, you know, mid-April so that we could um, have time to look at it, but then also meet the the timeline of of what Corinne just stated. In, in okay. fact, let's get a second on that. And staff, can you um, kind of look at the calendar now and give us what you feel is an appropriate date? I, Chair Hoffman, I'll second the motion. My question through the chair is twofold. One, uh, Ms. Van Blum, one is this going back to CPC because I think it's going to be really important for us to have their feedback. And two, when do you anticipate that the Nexus study is going to be complete or at least complete enough that we can, can see that and, and be able to speak a little more intelligently about it? Yeah, we can follow up um, and provide the Nexus studies to you um, through an email communication today. Um, they're also available on our website. Um, so my question for the commissioners is um, in terms of timing, um, we are happy to accommodate um, the continuance um, and would like to know how much time you would like to be able to review the materials. Uh, we can also, um, by um, probably the end of this week, tomorrow, um, provide you um, more full summaries of the fee amounts um, so that you can review those, as well as uh, have a chance to review the calculator that's available on our website. And uh, if I could just add to that for scheduling purposes, there are only two meetings in April. Um, one is April 7th and the other is April 21st. And then after that, May 5th is also available. Is May 5th within the 45 days? Sorry, Today. I can't count that fast. Me neither, hold on. Okay. I was thinking that the 21st, that's a, approximately a month. I'm hopeful that that's enough time. I, I was thinking the same that I, I think the 7th might be a little quick, but maybe that gives us a much uh, enough time to review and also enough time uh, to meet that 45 days if, if there's any follow-up. So would the motion maker um, and the second be amenable to that second meeting in April as part of the motion? Yes, April 21st. Yes. All right, we have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Modane to continue this item. Um, was that April 21st or 4th? Sorry. 21st. Uh, to April 21st, a date certain, uh, seconded by Commissioner Boomhauer. Um, let's go to Commissioner Otsuji. Thank you. I was, you know, as, you, as uh, Heidi has said that, you know, basically what we have in front of you, front of us is basically a policy and framework uh, that we're looking at. And <clears throat> I understood there's much more details uh, that, that need to be uh, worked out and uh, formulated. But at the same time, I've, you know, I've worked in the city of San Diego for 52 years. And I think this is the first time that I've seen a uh, a program that really addresses uh, the issues in front of us. I, I agree with all the other commissioners that, you know, this is a big picture that we're looking at 20 to 30,000 feet up in the air, but it hits all the right spots. Uh, I'm, I'm all for what has uh, been presented to us. And uh, I take the park master plan as an example of, uh, you know, where we started and where we're at uh, with that document. And I'm still very comfortable with that. And I was against that at the very beginning, the way it was done and put together and as it went through the process. But I feel much more comfortable today in regards to where it's at today, because you, the staff, and everybody else that had to follow through with the comments that we made uh, took it seriously and are addressing all those issues. And I really appreciate it uh, to the point that, you know, and, and I'll support the continuance, but I appreciate all the information that I've been given so far. And there was a lot in front of us. And I just personally just went 
uh, beyond that, being on the commission a long time, I just delve into other issues that relate to it, which uh, I can't discuss at this particular meeting, but it gives me more of an insight in regards to what you are looking at from a policy and framework standpoint. Um, good example of one of the things that has been brought up is, uh, you know, we just completed the uh, uh, community plan update for the barrio. That took a long time and it should have taken a long time, but the results are great in regards to the outcome. And one of the things was uh, the gentrification issue. And that is one of the first times that has been addressed in a community plan update. And I hope that, you know, that is in the forefront of many of the other community plan updates, because that's gonna play a very important factor in the underserved areas uh, of the communities that we have in San Diego. Um, I'm quite familiar, you know, living here for over 70 years of, you know, where those community are, communities are, and I've lived in, you know, uh, two or three different areas of San Diego, gives me a good idea of the history of where we're at today. A uh, couple of things I like to mention is uh, uh, on the funding side of it or where the money may possibly come from besides uh, the diff and a lot of the other impact fees that we have uh, like MAD and, and some other things and special, special funding that we have for different projects. But at the same time, if you can look into how the state and federal uh, funds that are now available, how, does, how is that going to affect uh, what we're talking about today? Is, is there gonna be impact, uh, especially on the infrastructure and housing point of view, is there gonna be state and federal money that is gonna be available that we would be able to use on something like this? And uh, the second thing is, uh, it's always great to build all these things, uh, these new inf infrastructure and facilities and all that. But we always tend to forget about the maintenance and operation requirement. This was mentioned in the policy and framework. And I feel that, you know, that's probably one of the most important things uh, that really needs to be addressed in detail with along with some of the other things that the commissioners have brought up because at the end, the maintenance and operation requirements, uh, you know, make the longevity of those uh, projects feasible into the future. So I'm just gonna leave it at that at this point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Van. And, and Commissioner Van, I, I want you to know, uh, I, I go alphabetically usually, but I go up and down. So please don't think you're always gonna be last. Uh, just want to make it easy for you for your first meeting. So I, that's the, I feel like, hey, you say the best for last is no problem. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Chair Hoffman. And one of the, 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 the sad things is you feel like you're repeating a lot of what's been said before, because I, I feel like uh, I heard a lot of good points that I completely uh, concur and align with, um, you know, from a builder side, um, you know, one of my one of my prides is the ability to put in place uh, housing affordable and market rate. And, um, you know, much to uh, what many of uh, the other commissioners said, uh, although I recognize that we're not approving fees, I think a big part of what we are approving, even in the, the fee construct, um, is understanding how that impact is going to be spread across our communities. And so, um, much like everybody else said, I, I would like to understand that a little better. Um, I hate to see projects that don't pencil uh, not come into fruition um, because we need housing, among other things. But you know, we need infrastructure upgrades, uh, but we definitely need housing. And um, what I would hate to see is, is um, a, a push through on something that could ultimately adversely affect our ability to put units in place um, that has come through through this commission. So um, I say all that to say that I concur with what I've heard um, uh, previously and um, completely support uh, continuance to get us just a little bit more information so that we can make a 
an informed um, recommendation. Um, so thank you all for the great work. I, and you know, I am completely excited to hear um, that we are tackling the issue of, of uh, equity in this manner. I think it's overdue. Um, we just need a little bit more information, I think. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as for me, uh, you know, in spite of my really desire to see a little more information, especially on the nexus and on the things the other commissioners have talked about, I, I truly believe this is a great direction that we're heading into. Um, and I think you've heard that from all the planning commission. So hi to you and Samira uh, and, and the rest of your staff have done a really excellent job. So please don't take my comments anyway, other than that I, I would like a little more information to feel a little bit more comfortable because this is a massive infrastructure change, um, but you guys have done a great job. So, but I, I definitely can support the, the motion. Um, is there anybody else we can go to round two? And if not, uh, let's go ahead and take a vote. Um, the motion on the floor is a continuance to a date certain April 21st, uh, which was made by Commissioner Modane and seconded by Commissioner Boomhauer uh, for time to allow staff to not only provide the nexus studies, but I think you uh, understood and maybe be prepared at that meeting to answer those concerns that have been brought up um, uh, by all the commissioners. So if that sounds okay with that, we'll go ahead and take a vote and let's start with Commissioner Boomhauer. Aye. Commissioner Malbro. Aye. Commissioner Miyahara. Aye. Commissioner Modane. Aye. Commissioner Otsuji. Aye. Commissioner Van. Aye. And Chairman Hoffman is an aye. So that motion passes. Uh, and with that, that concludes our agenda for today. And Renee is not looking at me, so I feel good. Yep, we're all we'll good.